here on the Pernicious Chattel channel, I'm being deliberately and viciously critical towards modern business, especially large corporations, capitalism, and the modern work culture. But I feel I need to clarify what my real objectives are. Because I am not actually a revolutionary, and I don't have a desire to overthrow our current system, to spark a revolution or create any type of utopia. My desire is actually extremely simple. I want to find a better way for myself. I desire understanding. I desire clarity. I desire hope. I desire a life that is authentic and psychologically satisfying. I've not lost sight of the fact that I'm quite lucky to have been born where I was at a time that I was, and with the opportunities that I was given. The system I grew up in afforded me free health care. It afforded me a basic level of free education. It afforded safety and security and plenty of inspiration in the form of, a, of being surrounded by a successful community. I am also lucky to have always had a secure access to a reliable source of all my basic human needs. I know what it's like to be, to be poor, uh, especially in, in my 20s, but I don't know what it's like to be homeless or to be hungry. My life likewise has afforded me some really amazing experiences, travel and exposure to many cultures, many ways of life, and amazing natural environments. These experiences were enriching in so many ways. My life and opportunities have also allowed me to develop confidence and flexibility and an ability to roll with the punches at obvious and often be able to figure things out to my own benefit. I don't spend a lot of time being concerned about my abilities to survive regardless of the environment or the community that I'm surrounded by. I know that I'm a really lucky person. Even now, out of work, I'm not afraid of starvation or bankruptcy. My immediate needs are met for the foreseeable future. And even if my resources are significantly constrained versus a year ago, I will be able to ensure that my children get university education, Everyone remains fed, dressed, and housed. My financial situation is actually one where my only sacrifice in the near future is money for luxuries, comforts, entertainment, as well as a dwindling safety net if I were to face an unforeseen crisis. So versus the vast majority of human experience, especially the past, I am among the most pampered, supported, and cared for people that has ever existed. So please understand, what I'm not doing is I am not deliberately attacking the incredible human accomplishment of raising 90% of the population of the entire earth out of extreme poverty. What I am deliberately doing is trying to put down a lifetime of indoctrination and outright brainwashing that comes from living within our current system. Because our current system has brought us incredible and material comfort does not mean that it is a perfect system. Because our wealth has been generated by capitalism does not mean that our future is linked to continuing to practice the current form of capitalism. It would be like saying that the medieval church, as a protector of language and learning, as a provider of stability in times of crisis, is always a force for good in the world. Just because something is successful does not mean it's the best we can do now or forever. I am informed by some of Fukuyama's ideas from his book the end of history. One idea is that to enable change, people in power have to reach a point where they, are no, where they no longer believe in the system that they serve and support. Now obviously, Fukuyama's ultimate thesis that we are approaching a future where Western liberal democracy becomes the only acceptable political system globally has turned out to be far from true. But much of the rest of his analysis is extremely clear-headed. 
You can't blindly believe in a system and also hope that it is evolving into something that is better. People can't support a progressive move toward a better future until they become willing to question the present. People can't change for the better until they accept that they have a problem. What's that famous addiction phrase? Admitting you have a problem is the first step. Death a blind allegiance, the death of fear, is the first step in allowing our current system to evolve. So on a personal level, I'm trying to achieve a clearing of my own path forward. I'm trying to own, undo my own indoctrination in the hope that I'll be able to see clearly. I'm trying to pull myself out of the society that I've lived in for the past 52 years as a way of un uncluttering my, my authentic self. Once I put down the beliefs that I grew up with, what will remain? I can't be consistently and authentically myself, though, until I've swept away everything that is not mine. This means attacking the belief I've held on, held on to so intensely that somehow winning in life means being a professional, making a large income, and having a lot of stuff. I need to destroy my own materialism, my belief that through career success, I can satisfy my deepest needs. The materialist path has failed me spectacularly. Yet the assumption, the prejudices, and the inherited values that support this delusion do remain. I still feel emotionally attached to the concept of being productive and independent. I still feel emotionally attached to the belief that my pride is linked to my bank account and my job description and title. I still feel guilty when I sit and think for too long without doing something. I still feel guilty when I tell people that I've quit my job and I'm not looking for another. I still feel tempted to allow my programming to decide my future rather than decide for myself based on my own needs and my own desires. I still feel drawn to big paychecks and to prom prominent jobs, even though I know chasing these things will only lead to more soul-crushing disappointments. Selling myself into service of another company will not be the answer to my lifetime of disappointment. I'm also informed by one of the things that I learned far too late in my career. And that lesson was that I am at my most effective, most influential, and most confident when I can describe clearly what is really going on and when I reject the common narrative. For instance, when I could explain to my team that our outward appearance, professional communication, were often more important in maintaining our superior's confidence and our ability to move forward on projects than was our actual results. The predictability of our performance forecasts were much more important than our actual performance. The quality of our ideas and plans were often less important than presenting those plans in simple ways using expected language, using accepted, by that I mean tried and true approaches to problems, even if our actual plans and programs were going to be different. Sometimes the best idea would be rejected on the basis that it was novel alone. So being boring and repetitive could be the best way forward for your career and your reputation, even if it might threaten the future performance of the company. Having this clear view of what was really happening and what was really driving the people who were around me, and particularly the people who, were, who I was reporting to, understanding those human dynamics was incredibly powerful. Whereas trying to slavishly satisfy some sort of by-the-book instruction or trying to implement the inspirational values that you've been told that your company holds dear are often a surefire way to failure and to mediocrity. The discovery that I was making was that as much as you might hear about innovation and creativity as an aspiration, Creative and innovative ideas were those that were the hardest to get approved and the most likely to cause discomfort, if not outright rejection, by senior management. In general, the overriding emotion in most meetings was insecurity, so the conservative, the tried and true, 
and repetitive actions were far easier to propose and get approved. But then it was easy to implement your plan, and in parallel you could try some new and innovative ideas, thereby testing those innovative ideas out, finding them to be practical and useful, and then being able to present them as part of your results, and then rolling them into the tried and true. To put this in simpler language, I was most effective when I could see bullshit for what it is. And more importantly, when I could repeat bullshit when it served the purpose of achieving worthwhile goals. At the same time, while clarity made me better at my job, it also enhanced my own cognitive dissonance. I was working for an organization that I didn't respect and for people who were simply frightened bureaucrats. Their primary concern was maintaining their boss's favor, and change was simply too risky to do very often. As living with this dissonance became unbearable, and as I began to look seriously at what I found interesting and challenging, I became increasingly frustrated. That frustration bled through into my performance as impatience, as inconsistent effort, and at times as complete disinterest or cynicism. I simply began to lose my motivation to the point where acting as a good employee was just too personally costly. I was slowly beginning to rebel and that rebellion led to my resignation and ultimately to this channel. But my current objective in relentless criticism of modern employment is not to encourage an open rebellion. History tells us that popular revolutions often lead to new and unexpected horrors. And I agree with Fukuyama here. Our current system is the best that humanity has ever come up with. Emphasis here is very important. Ever come up with so far. What I'm trying to do is smash delusional thinking and indoctrination I want to raise my own consciousness and also raise the consciousness of those of you who similarly are suspicious about the current circumstances that we find ourselves in. This consciousness raising can prepare our minds to be open to new and exciting opportunities for change. This consciousness raising can create greater openness for innovators who want to step into change. This consciousness raising can prepare our society to be open to the discussion, to the problem identification, to new experimental approaches, and prepared for bearing the risks that will come with this change. As well, my current objective is to help those who are still in the system, like I was for so many years, to see more clearly the outline and the structure of the system that they find themselves in, to understand that our sense of duty and moral obligation to our employers is misplaced, and that we need to have a carefully balanced view of our own needs. I want workers to understand that the system in a way that allows them to make better decisions for themselves, whether that to be to pursue salary increases, promotions, or the easiest possible work-life balance. I want people to believe in using your employment as a means to an end without ever drinking the Kool-Aid. It's not an immoral choice to protect yourselves at the expense of your employer. It is a rational decision. Having a clearer and less romanticized version of our careers and our workplaces is a necessary step if we hope to, ma to manage our environments in the best way possible. Having an objective view of our careers is the best way to identify if we are on the right track and that our current life is building towards a future that we actually want. I also want employers to understand that there is a significant significant segment of their workforce who just doesn't believe the rosy picture of life that you're trying to sell them, who doesn't feel nurtured or supported by the environment that you try to provide for them, who doesn't believe what you say to them. These employees aren't necessarily bad for your business. In fact, they might be some of your most talented and skillful workers. But these people need authentic 
truthful conversations if they are to have a trusting relationship with you. Being honest and open with them about what you truly believe and letting them decide for themselves how to orient themselves to your business will build trust. It will also help to motivate them. I know this was true of myself. When I was given some vague catchphrase story by some middle mid-level manager who was more often than not just reading a script prepared by someone else, I found myself becoming more skeptical and distrustful. On the other hand, when I sat face to face with my boss and we had the really hard conversations in an honest and sometimes painful way, I find myself feeling trusted, treated with respect, and my motivation to achieve rose. I suspect, with a few exceptions, most employees are more like me than different. We are at our best when we're treated like a trusted adult. We are at our best when we're presented with the truth. We are at our best when we respect our management because they demonstrate courageous honesty, even when it might result in some unhappy people. What I want for myself and for those of you, my viewers, is to encourage a deep searching of ourselves, to probe the very base of who we are and what our aspirations really are. I want to know if my actions are authentic to me, to me, who I am. Once you've stripped away my white Anglo-Saxon Protestant work ethic, once you've stripped away my belief in the Horatio Alger myth about the self-made man, who I am when stripped of the belief that wealth makes me special. I want to start pursuing a life that is consistent with that authentic self so that it becomes fulfilling, at least in equal proportion to how much it pays. I want to, for the first time in my life, to be able to stand up and say I work because it's the right thing for me. I produce because it helps me to fill the world with more things that I think are important. I work because I want to leave a better and more fulfilling world for my children. But to find authentic value, values, we need to be honest with ourselves. We need to discard outside influences, not because we don't want to listen to facts, data, or the opinion of experts, but because we spend the time necessary to balance the opinions against the beliefs that we hold most dear. We take the time to develop a compromise with the world that we can live with. I'm pushing back, back against the commonly held opinion. I am using radical ideas and sometimes highly cynical criticisms, but not only because I'm enthralled by intellectual gymnastics, but because I want to instill a habit of constant questioning, of refusing to accept anything just because it's been said repeatedly or it seems to make some kind of gut sense. I want to come to conclusions that are rigorous because they have been probed and tested and still appear robust. I can't see any other way forward for those of us who both want to be a part of this imperfect world and who desperately want to move this world in the direction of utopia. We're realistic enough to know that utopia is a dream, but principled enough to believe that there is real morality in trying. I am pushing back against the system because I want to find my own true and authentic path. I am pushing back in a public way because I don't want to walk this path by myself. Even if our destinations are different, I know that there are others out there who also want to find a better way and we are more likely to succeed together. We are better as a fire coalescing into a firestorm than as many spread out and guttering candles. This is XCG and I'm inviting you to walk the path with me. Please subscribe, hit that like button and help to spread this message. As always, may you begin to sprint down your path to freedom.